So we've got three main areas that we can look at in terms of remote sensing information extraction. So I talked at the top about image classification and thematic maps, which was, as I just demonstrated with you guys, you have boys versus girls or, say, forest versus water, those hard boundaries between your individual classes. So biophysical modelling is looking at quantitative mapping, so dealing with actual values within the environment and being able to estimate a particular biophysical property based on the numbers within a pixel rather than giving those hard boundaries. And then if we step into spatial modelling and GIS integration, that's really about bringing all sorts of other pieces of spatial information into your model to help guide classifications or other forms of models as well. So when we look at uh, classification or generally hard, hard boundary mapping, um, we can look at pixel-based classification, which, was, which is what we've done in the practicals for the past couple of weeks. So we mentioned the unsupervised and also supervised classifications. Um, and really what we're assuming there is that the pixels that we have in our image is actually smaller than the features in the environment that we're trying to map. Okay, so with a Landsat image, what size is our pixel? A 30 metre pixel. So we're not trying to map individual trees. Okay, we're trying to map features that are much, much larger than that 30 metre pixel size. And what we're also assuming, and it's a little loose, but, but what we say in our assumption is that um, whatever is, is in each of those pixels is homogenous as well. Okay. We're going to look at image-based object segmentation this afternoon in our practical. And here we, we're also assuming that our, that our pixel is smaller than our targets of interest. But what we can actually do with, uh, with object-based classification is we draw together adjacent pixels and we start to look at classifying objects in general. Okay, So rather than classifying a pixel by pixel, we bring together close ones and then try and figure out what the, what the features are in general. And this will become a lot clearer this afternoon when we go through our little exercise. Um, the other type of classification we've got is sub-pixel classification. All right, so this is where we're actually acknowledging that the pixel we have on the ground is larger than our feature of interest. Okay, so for example, if we want to use Landsat again, we've got that 30 by 30 metre pixel. Can I work out how many trees are in that pixel, all right? And to do that, what I'd have to do is to try and break down the, the spectral signatures that I, that I get out of that pixel and figure out what its components are made of, okay? So could I work out that I have 50% trees or vegetation and 50% water within that pixel, for example, okay? So just different types and they all have their place, okay? There's no one that is better than any others generically and it depends on the, the type of application that you're working on. <coughs> so just a little bit more about those assumptions, okay? So here's an example here where we have our pixel that's smaller than the feature that we're interested in. An example here where the pixel is much larger. Okay, so this type of scenario we call H resolution um, and this one is an L resolution problem. Okay, so just terminology. All right, and so you can quite clearly see here within this example, I've got say a tree crown or a green cloud, whatever you want, um, but you can see that it, it occupies some part of that pixel and if you, could, if you could see that on the ground, you'd be able to make an estimate of just how much of that pixel is comprised by that particular green cloud or tree. Okay? But the challenge then is when you actually see that pixel in a remote sensing image to try and extract out just what that composition is. Okay, so when we want to deal with classification, so again, that's, that's making those hard boundaries, boys, girls, forest, water, sand, etc. What we're really trying to, what we're really looking at is making sure that we have every pixel that we give a name, okay? And to do that, what we're assuming is that our different classes are spectrally different. So forest does look different to water. And anything that's forest 
actually looks like forest and they all look similar to each other and all the water bits look similar to each other as well. Okay, so they look different from each other but similar within the class themselves. Okay, and that's, that's the broad assumption that we make. And you can, you can see in our practical exercises um, that, that we did the week before last that there's quite a bit of a problem in overlapping areas as well when we're looking at that, the spectral information. But really what the goal is to come up with a general thematic map of your region, okay, having those, those classes that you've identified as being important for your particular application. So stepping through an example here, you guys did unsupervised classification in the practical exercise. So it was pretty easy for you, you just typed in that you wanted the software to come up with 10 classes and it clustered together pixels that looked similar to each other. So that's unsupervised classification where you decide how many classes and then the software does it for you and then you name those classes. If we, go, if we go through to supervised classification, this is where we understand a little bit about the image before we go into that process. Okay, so this is, this is an example. This is Wellington in New Zealand on the south of the North Island. And in, this is a spot image. So it's got green, red, near infrared and a shortwave infrared band. Okay, and what I've done is I've identified four main classes that I think that I want to create in this particular scene. So I've said I want some water, some grasses, some dense vegetation and artificial surfaces. Okay, so I can go in and create spectral signatures of those, of those general areas to get an idea of what they look like. And you guys have done this in NV2, so you know what it looks like with your wavelength on your x-axis and the reflectance on the y. And this looks a little different to the Landsat curves that you're used to looking at because it doesn't have that blue band, okay? So it doesn't drop down um, for those vegetation curves, okay? But you can see in those curves that there's, that there's difference between the pixels that I've selected as being representative. Of my, um, of my features. So that's a good start. Okay, I can see separability in some bands, if not all bands. Um, so that's something that I can work with. Another thing that I can do is to look at this in a, in a different way to try and understand where pixels lie in what we call spectral space. So if you imagine this as a graph, and if I've got the green reflectance on the x-axis down the bottom and the near-infrared reflectance on the y-axis, something that has high green reflectance and high near-infrared reflectance, the two combined, is going to fall up in this general region. Okay? Something that's low green, low near-infrared, falls down this area here. And you can see I've got a number of little data points down here. Okay, so I've got four clusters of these are pixel values, okay, that represent water, grasses, dense veg, and artificial surfaces. So does anyone want to hazard a guess at what this particular group of pixels represent? Okay, so why does that represent water? Yeah, low reflectance in both green and near infrared. Okay, and what's nice about this little group here is that you can see they're all really close together. Okay, so all the pixels that I've chosen for that class do look similar to each other and they look quite different to these other ones as well, which gives me an indication that water is going to classify quite nicely in my image. Okay, so here's our water, here's our dense vegetation, the grasses and artificial surfaces. Okay, so you can you get it, start to get a bit of a feel for the internal variety in those classes as well, which is also what you're looking at when you looked at your histograms, um, the practical that we did the week before last, but just looking at it in a different way. So here's what the classification looks like when I, when I, when I actually run the algorithm to produce that based on the statistics that I've put it in. So here's my original and here's my end classification as well. Okay. So like I said, the water comes out nicely, which is what I expected because it did look quite different to everything else um, and but similar to itself. Um, and there's, there's various issues in that particular map, but that was something that I could create you know, within 10 minutes or so to get a real rapid base image of what it looks like. So it just gives you a bit of a feel for how supervised classification goes as opposed to unsupervised that we've done in the practical session. 
So we just have a quick look at biophysical modelling before we get into our exercise for this morning. Okay, so biophysical modelling is looking at quantitative mapping. Okay, so again, when you guys stood up here to look at your height difference, um, and I said one group stand forward, one group stand back, can you estimate what your height should be if you know you're sitting in a certain area? And that's exactly what biophysical modelling is doing. Okay, so what we, what we do is we get a pixel on an image and we make some measurement on the ground as to what is in that pixel. All right, so it might be the amount of chlorophyll that's represented, the tree density, the, um, the ocean surface temperature, any of these sorts of values that you're interested in. Okay, but they're on a quantitative scale as opposed to water, forest, sand. Okay, so just, just remember thinking about estimating values in real units. Okay, so there's, there's some examples of different types of biophysical models there, um, looking at leaf area index, which is really based around vegetation, pollution, water depth, all these sorts of things that are quantitative maps. So to actually go about creating a quantitative product, really what's key is we want the, the reflectance value in a particular wavelength or even a combination of wavelengths, like an NDVI, for example, and we create a relationship between that value in your pixel and some form of biophysical parameter. Okay, so it doesn't matter what it is. It could be um, an increasing um, increasing value in near infrared, for example, and increasing vegetation density. Okay, so you would you'd actually start to see this relationship develop. Okay, so any of these points here would represent the pixel and the corresponding quantitative variable that you have collected in the field. And then what, what you do is just to create a relationship between your data points, okay? You can do that sort of thing quite easily in Excel as well to figure out what the, what the equation of that line is, okay? So then if I was to go into, go into the image and have a look at a pixel that I hadn't measured in the field and worked out its reflectance value, figure out where it falls along this line, and then match it up to the line here to then decide what that biophysical parameter estimation is for that particular pixel. So here's an example of doing just that, looking at water clarity, okay? So this is, a, this is an example out of the Lillison textbook for anyone that's, that's using that one. So here's a Landsat image. Um, the first step that they went through was to get rid of all the land because they were just interested in the, in the lake clarity. So no point in confusing things by having land there. So here's the resultant bits and pieces of lakes. Now what they worked out was they could look at the ratio between bands 1 and 3 of Landsat, um, Landsat 5 or 7. Okay, so that's the blue and the red band. So it's slightly different to Landsat 8. Um, and looked at the ratio of those two bands. So in a similar way that we looked at, at the NDVI, for example. Okay, so come up with, with those values within the ratio and then had some, had some field measurements associated with particular areas that they then plot up on the y-axis there. So put all, the, put all the data points on your graph, come up with that relationship line, and then reapply that back to the image, okay? So they've come up with this overall map of general clarity of the water, okay? So this could represent any biophysical variable on that y-axis, okay? So this is always something to do with the pixel value, so the reflectance in, in a single band or, or multiple bands in a ratio, but then something that you're trying to measure on the ground, okay? So, so key is that you need, the, you need calibrated data to be able to get to this point and you need field data as well, okay?